So um, today, just one more time on Kripke on names. And uh, yes, today is just one more time in Kripke on names. And uh, by the end of today, I mean, today is really a kind of set of exercises to just work through the, the main technical points we've covered already. And um, if you're comfortable with everything that happens today, then uh, actually, in my view, you really are where the state of the art is on current thinking about proper names. As you'll see, there are some questions that are wide open and still people don't know um, how to address. Uh, so I want to begin from where we left off last time on necess necessity and a prioricity. And uh, then look at a kind of compare and contrast between Kripke and Russell on logically proper names. And then uh, this problem we've touched on a few times about how a sign, how a name in particular, can have meaning even if it doesn't stand for anything. This goes back to squiggle and um, dot and smudge, those examples we had. Okay, necessary. Necessary means it's true in all possible worlds. Yeah, 2 plus 2 is 4, that's necessary. Um, there's no world in which it's not true. What's the opposite of necessary? Contingent, very good. Um, and uh, a priori is, you can, know, you can know it just by figuring it out. You can know it otherwise than on the basis of experience. Um, 2 plus 2 is 4. A priori or not? A priori, um, nothing can be red and green all over. That pen is yours? No. This is a priori or a posteriori? A posteriori, very good. <laughs> okay, so this has to do with knowledge. And this one about necessity, it doesn't really have to do with knowledge. It's just... Um, uh, it has to do. It has something to do with um, the way the world couldn't but be, or what ways it's possible for the world to be. Not anything particularly to do with knowledge. So this is kind of a metaphysical notion to do with the way reality is. Yeah. Okay. So here, are, here are all our friends, the all the possible worlds. Uh, one of them is actual. Um, some of them are closer than others and it's necessary if it's true in all possible worlds so if you consider Hesperus as Hesperus is that necessary? it couldn't but be that Hesperus is Hesperus right? Um, and we, we talked about this in terms of rigid designation Hesperus is a rigid designator right? so in every possible world it refers to the same thing so if Hesperus um, and Hesperus in the actual world refer to the same thing, then Hesperus refers to everything, uh, to the same thing in every possible world, and um, Hesperus again refers to the same thing in every possible world. So as you go from world to world, he is Hesperus Hesperus? Is Hesperus Hesperus? You're always looking at the same object, and it's always going to be one in the same object. So it's necessary. All right. Is it a priori that Hesperus is Hesperus? Yes? You, you can do that one just by thinking about it, right? You can all do that one just by thinking about it if you just put your mind to it. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Hesperus is phosphorus. Is it necessary? Could it might Hesperus not be phosphorus? Aha. Is Hesperus a rigid designator? Does Hesperus stand for the same object in every possible world? You know, if you say, could Hesperus have been the star um, which shone on our love that first night? When, when you look over here, when, you, when you're raising those questions about what could have happened with Hesperus, um, is it the same object you're talking about, the same star? 
every world you look in, every counterfactual situation you think about. It's always the same one, right? Remember that thing about Al Gore? Could, could, could it have been Al who was president? It's always the same objects in every world, right? So when you ask counterfactual questions about what could have happened to Hesperus, it's always the same object. Now follow me very closely here. When you ask counterfactual questions about what could have happened to Phosphorus in different possible worlds, is it always the same object you're talking about? Yes? It is always the same object you're talking about, right? It's just that they, they both work just the same way as Al Gore or something like that, right? So they are both rigid designators. They both refer to the same thing in every possible world. That's just a way of saying, when you talk about what could have happened, the names are always ways of making sure you keep tabs in the same thing and talk about what's going on with it in every world. Is that plain as day? If I'm explaining it correctly, it should be plain as day. What's the problem? Uh, we haven't got that far yet. Um, <laughs> we're kind of working up to that. We're still, we are still going to reflect on whether it's necessary. Okay? It's not necessary. Is that, is that what you said? Speak into the microphone. Why is it Okay, well, just th this is where you have to follow me very closely. It's very important that you're comfortable with this thing about them both being rigid designators. Whenever you talk about what's going on, what would have happened, what could have happened, right? When you use a name to specify what might have happened, what could have happened, right? you are always using it to talk about the same thing and keep tabs on what happened to that thing in this counterfactual situation. Is that, does that make sense? This is just that thing about Al Gore. Uh, yeah, you look, it's always Al through <laughs> all, <laughs> all, all the roller coaster of all these different counterfactual scenarios. Sometimes it's good, sometimes it's bad. But when you're talking about what might have happened to Al, it's always the same person, always the same man. Yeah? Similarly with Hesperus and Phosphorus. Plain as day. Okay, so they're both rigid designators, Hesperus and Phosphorus, like every name. Okay. Okay, now then. Now then. Consider the actual world. Is Hesperus identical to Phosphorus in the actual world? I can tell you the answer to that. It's one of the few things I do know. <laughs> they are. It's one and the same star, right? If you learn nothing else in this class, you know so far that the evening star is definitely the morning star, all right? Of that, there can be no doubt. Yeah? Okay, so in this world, Hesperus and Phosphorus refer to the same thing. Now consider what's going on in this world here. The name Hesperus r is rigid. Right? So Hesperus picks out an object here, it picks out the same object here. Yep. And if Phosphorus picks out an object here, it picks out the same object here as it picks out there. Yep. So they're both picking out the object in this world that is identical to the start object in the actual world. This object is identical to your start object in the actual world. This object is identical to your start object in the actual world. If two things are identical to the same thing, then they're identical to each other. Was that too fast? Okay. So is Hesperus the same thing as Phosphorus in this world? Okay. But I just chose that world at random. I could repeat this reasoning for this world. I could repeat it for any world there. Is there going to be any world in which they come apart, Hesperus and Phosphorus? Therefore, there's no world in which Hesperus is not Phosphorus. So it's necessary. Necessary just means. What does necessary mean? It's true in all the possible worlds. We just went through all the possible worlds, and it comes out true in all of them. So it's necessary that Hesperus is Phosphorus. It just follows. You bought all the premises. You said, yes, we're comfortable with all the premises. Right? 
it, that's the conclusion. Okay? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Right. So there's no way of reconciling. No well, uh, <laughs> not without a significant complication. Right. Um, the description is flexible. The name is rigid. So if you have the description, its reference is going to vary from world to world. Yeah. Who's the president is going to vary from world to world. Um, which star shone in our love? will vary from world to world, but um, uh, the reference of Hesperus doesn't vary. Yep. Is it a priori that Hesperus is phosphorus? No. So it's necessary, but it's not a priori. Isn't that weird? Isn't that strange and obsessive? Yeah? One thing here is, remember wh when I first started talking about what's necessary or possible, I said there's a difference between um, thinking about possibility as having to do with what could have happened and thinking about possibility as relating to what might have happened so far as we know. Did I mean, let me, if, 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 um, uh, if I wake up I might not be, you know, if I've been traveling a lot, I might not be very sure which town I'm in, right? I might think, is this Berkeley or am I still in Melbourne? Yeah, that's one issue. So I, I wake up, I'm in a hotel room, I could be practically anywhere on the planet. Um, uh, I say, well, I think it's Melbourne. Yeah, that can happen. It might be Melbourne. It's a different thing if I um, stand in front of you thinking, if only... I had applied for that job in Australia. I could be on a beach in Melbourne right now. But when I say that, I'm not thinking to myself, well, maybe I am on a beach in Melbourne right now. Right? The whole tragedy is, I'm not on a beach in Melbourne right now. You see what I mean? When I have these regrets, which crowded in me <laughs> as, 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 as the years go on, um, the whole thing is I'm thinking about what might have happened, what could have been, ways things might have been, but aren't, right? So when I'm thinking about them, I'm thinking about things I know perfectly well are not the case, right? So it's that way of thinking about possibility here. We're thinking about what might have been. We're not thinking about what could be so far as we know. Hesperus is definitely phosphorus. So we know definitely we can rule it out that Hesperus is not phosphorus. In that sense, it's necessary, right? We know for sure. But there's another sense in which it's necessary too. It couldn't have been otherwise. There is no point in having a regret to the effect that Hesperus is not phosphorus. Would that Hesperus had not been phosphorus. Do you see what I mean? It might have turned out that Hesperus was not phosphorus. I might have made a mistake about that. But if Hesperus is phosphorus, then Hesperus is necessarily phosphorus. Put your hand up if you're comfortable with that. <laughs> or at any rate, if you don't want me to talk about it anymore. <laughs> okay? Okay, very good. Okay. How about if you're not comfortable? Is your hand up? Or? No? Okay, right. No, right. Okay, okay, very good. Okay, if they're both rigid, Hesperus and Phosphorus, then if it's true that Hesperus is Phosphorus, then it's necessary. Okay. There are still things that are puzzling here, but it seems to be a definite result here that that's necessary, the not a priori. So it's very tempting to put the two together and say ne it's natural to think, well, necessary just means the same thing as a priori, but they don't mean the same thing. Yep. Well, because the evening star is the morning star. I mean, uh, Hesperus is the one you see in the morning. Phosphorus is the one you see in the evening. You had to do some astronomy to figure out it was the same thing. Y you see what I mean? This was one of these informative identities. I mean, that actually, 
now that I think of it, this is what we spent the first two weeks on, right? Um, but it's not a priori, it's an informative identity. Yeah? So you get these informative identities that w with names that are usually necessary. Yep. Um, yeah, I, I didn't quite put it that way. That's a natural reading, but I, I didn't put it that way. I just said you can know it without having to rely on experience. That's a, that might be right, but that's a further step, right? I mean, suppose that there's a way the mind can know things that doesn't depend on meaning. If there is, then there will be things that are a priori, but don't have to do with meaning. Yeah. So th that's an open question. Yeah. You're saying, no, no, you, if, if you know it without having to look, then it must be because of the meanings of the words. You might be right about that, but that's a, th that's a theory you've got there. Yeah. Uh-huh. Yes. Very good. Okay. Um, um, well, uh, yeah, if you know the meaning of the sign, you know what object it stands for. Yeah? But the puzzle here is, you can know what object Hesperus stands for and know what object Phosphorus stands for without knowing that they stand for the same object. Uh, to say it's rigid is just to say it stands for the same thing in every possible world. It's a step. Th th these things you have to take very slowly. It's a step from that to say something about meaning. All I said was something about what's going on in these, all these different possible scenarios. Uh, yeah. Right. That's right. Very good. Uh, okay, I said a priori is can be known otherwise than on the basis of experience. Now, your point is, um, I mean, it's not, it's not so, uh, with two plus two and four, but, but what you say is, is kind of obvious, but there are plenty of examples 25 times 25 is 625, um, I think. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so you, you have to figure that out, right? You might know, understand everything perfectly well, but not have done the, done the work here. Um, uh, so you've got some work to do, right? Well, um, a priori means you can know it without having to look, right? So when I do the thing 25 is times 25 is 625, what I do there is I do it in my head. I don't, I don't mean to boast, but I don't need to look. Yeah. No, but that's the whole thing about informative identities, um, that you can understand the two signs perfectly well but not know that it's true, and then you've got to look to see that it's true. Remember that thing about the rising sun being the same one every morning? That, that, you know, Frege was right about that. You, you, you can't just tell, tell that it's the same one just by thinking about it. Or take Superman and Clark Kent. Lois knows Clark Kent perfectly well. She's met Superman many times. right? She knows what each of them stands for. They stand for the same thing. She doesn't know that. And she can't figure it out just by... She's got to f track him to the phone booth. Uh, you, you see what I mean? Uh, uh, 
but that's that's the whole thing. She, you know, you, you don't. Uh, <laughs> I mean, it would be a very different story if, in the early stages, Lois was saying, "Now, who is Clark Kent again?" I, <laughs> I know that name's familiar. <laughs> do, do you see what I mean? I mean, the whole point is she knows perfectly well who each of them is. Uh, you, you, you're a question. That's great. I think that's exactly right. And I think that's what Kripke would say too. Um, there was a stage at which you didn't know. And at that stage you could say, well, it might be, it might turn out that Hesperus is not Phosphorus. And that's right. But look, th think about it in the Clark Kent Superman case, right? Um, Lois might lament that Superman had really turned out to be Clark Kent. Yeah. Um, I could, <laughs> what a disappointment! <laughs> right. um, uh, but if so, that's one thing she could wish it had turned out. Otherwise, that's just as you say. Um, but suppose she knows all the facts and she says, um, "Oh, I wish that Superman were not Clark Kent." It doesn't really make sense when you think about it. Um, suppose you've got another possible world in which the two of them have come apart, Superman and Clark Kent. Which one's identical to the original object? In this world, there's only one of them, right? There's just this one person who has both guises. Um, so now we can see another possible world in which there are two of them, they've come apart. Well, one of, only one of them can be identical to the original person. Right? The ca two different things can't be identical to the same thing. No. <laughs> Let's take this slowly. Um, <laughs> that was only a joke. Okay. All right. <laughs> do, 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 we, do we need to work through this? If A and B, if A is different to B, right? and A is identical to C, then B cannot be identical to C too. I mean, it cannot also be identical to C. Right? Please note it. Uh, uh, that's okay. Right. So, if Superman, if you've got a possible world where Superman and Clark Kent are two different people, then only one of them can be identical to the guy in this world. They can't both be identical because they're different things. Okay. That's right. That's right. Okay. Um, but then there's nobody in this world who's identical to Clark Kent or Superman. There's nobody. Yeah, there's none of them in that world who's identical to Clark Kent or Superman. Yeah, or either of them. Because it's one and the same thing. Yeah. So neither of them is identical to Clark Kent, neither of them is identical to Superman. So that's not. So you haven't described a world after all in which Clark Kent is not Superman. Okay. Uh, you. you.
Uh, we yeah, haven't talked. Yeah. Yeah. We haven't talked about analytics, right? Well, analytic. No, someone was talking about meaning earlier, right? Analyticity has to do with meaning. <coughs> uh, the notion of analytic has to do with what's true in virtue of meaning. And this is a new friend, you know, we haven't talked about that one yet. And that's a different notion to these two as well. Look at the definitions. Look at the definition of necessity, right? Yeah. True in all possible worlds. Do we see the word meaning in this definition? Okay. Look at the definition of a priori, can be known otherwise than on the basis of experience. Do we see the word meaning in this definition? No, we do not. <laughs> Sorry? You may think so. I couldn't possibly comment, right? I mean, uh, uh, they're just different notions, right? You might say they're connected. No, I didn't say that. The meaning is that wh to know the meaning is to know what makes it true, yeah. right? What would make it true? Right. Yeah. They're all interconnected. There's no denying that, but they're not all identical either, right? They're connected, but they're not the same thing. That's right. That's right. There has to be some relation. We're not talking about that just yet, right? I mean, but. I just want to get it that it's different, necessary, and a priori, and that is already difficult. Um, you, 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 you. Oh, I thought I was clearing everything up so well, but <laughs> try and articulate what's confusing. I think th there's a part of what you're saying there that is just absolutely correct, and I'm not disputing it. Um, I'm just saying uh, uh, Lois can lament that Superman turned out to be Clark Kent. Th th that's just correct, and it doesn't contradict anything here. Um, what Lois can't wish is that Superman had not been Clark Kent. That's the thing we just went through, because there is no world in which there are two different objects one of whom is identical to Clark Kent and the other whom is identical to Superman. Well, I, They're different I things, think wishing it had turned out to be so. Yeah. Yeah. You might be right, actually. I, I, I might be putting it too strong when I put it in terms of what you wish could have happened. I mean, um, suppose I'm a mathematician doing a complex proof, and I'm trying to get it to work. I think I've got the, my proof right. And then, then at some point, it just, it just doesn't work. And I say to myself, my God, if only 2 plus 2 had not been 4, this proof would have worked, right? Damn it. <laughs> okay. um, so, you know, Lois could do it in that kind of vein. Um, but the fact that I can have that wild regret about 2 plus 2 and 4 um, doesn't show that there's a possible world of which 2 plus 2 is not 4. Yeah. So I'm, I may be tying wishing what you could wish for, wish had been the case, too strongly to possibility here. Yeah. Uh, yeah.
That's true. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So that's Certainly, tractor beams. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. That doesn't follow. Um, th this is the thing I keep saying about, suppose I'd taken that job in Melbourne or whatever. Um, you, you're saying for all we know, it might, you know, and in that sense it might be that Hesperus is not phosphorus. Yeah? Yeah. Um, but suppose Hesperus is phosphorus, whether we know it or not, yeah? then the point is there's no possible world in, in this metaphysical sense in which the two of them come apart. Just suppose it really is so, that Hesperus is phosphorus here, then Hesperus is phosphorus everywhere. That's right, yeah. yeah. Uh, okay, last one, and then we should move on, yeah. <laughs> if I could do a bit better. <laughs> well, um, so what you would like is an example of yeah. something that's metaphysically necessary, but not a truth of logic and not analytic. Yeah, or vice versa. Okay. Okay. Well, um, consider the remark, Hesperus is phosphorus. Is that um, analytic? I mean, an analytic truth is something like bachelors are unmarried. Right, something that you can know to be true in virtue of knowing the meanings of the world. Well, if you're understanding you're no, because you know the reference of this. I mean, this was Frege's point. You know the reference of this, and you know the reference of this, but you don't know whether the whole thing is true. We did this. You know, we did this. Right. This is where we be, where we began. Mm -hmm. Right. So e even if you think that all there is to the meaning is the reference, you've got to acknowledge that you can know the meaning of this, know the meaning of that, without knowing that the whole thing is true. Think about Lois, right? Lois knows perfectly well what the name Clark Kent stands for. She knows perfectly well what the name Superman stands for. She does not know it's the same thing, right? Um, Okay, so, you, so it's not analytic. Is it a truth of logic that Hesperus is phosphorus? Is it metaphysically necessary that Hesperus is phosphorus? Right. But, but you see you, you, you see the argument so far. I mean, the thing about it is not analytic, it's just informative identity. Yeah, it's just the thing. Yeah. Okay. Okay, well, I cannot say that you all look comfortable with that exactly, but you, I, I, you see, you, I, I guess everybody sees the kind of theoretical framework, at any rate, whether you think it makes an ounce of sense or not. Okay. okay. Um, if you want to go back over this. I think, uh, 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 maybe look at the slides for, for, for well, I think it was the last lecture uh, where we talked about um, epistemic and metaphysical. And, uh, and Kripke talks about this a lot anyway. Okay, okay, here's another exercise. 
Um, what about this? Suppose we are thinking about the history of early mankind, right? Now, think about the cavemen. The cavemen invented the wheel. Let us suppose that one among the cavemen invented the wheel. It might have been a man, it might have been a woman. What do you think? Male or female, the inventor of the wheel. Um, let's call him or her Bright, just to give them a name. Right? Okay. So we've got Bright is the name for the inventor of the wheel. Now follow me very closely here. Bright is a name. Is Bright a rigid designator? or a flexible designator. If I say, um, Bright might not have invented the wheel, am I still using that name, Bright, to keep tabs on the same object in a different counterfactual scenario? Yes, it's rigid. <laughs> Why isn't it rigid? That's right. Well, I do, it's the inventor of the wheel. I fixed the reference. What more do you want? That's right. That's the way it goes in different possible yeah. worlds. Things. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So this is rigid, right? And the inventor of the wheel is a description. When you look at the inventor of the wheel in different possible worlds, is it always the same person or different people? Different people. So this is flexible. Right? Okay. So bright is rigid. As you track from world to world, bright always refers to the same thing. The inventor of the wheel refers to different things as you track from world to world. Okay? Therefore, consider the remark bright is the inventor of the wheel. I mean, okay. I just introduced the name Bright to you. Okay. I said, uh, whoever's the inventor of the wheel, we'll call that one Bright. Is it a priori that Bright is the inventor of the wheel? Can you tell whether that's true? Suppose, okay, suppose at this point, I just explained the name Bright to you, right? I said, we don't know whether it's male or female, what do you think? Um, but we'll call the inventor of the wheel Bright anyway, just to give him a name. Doesn't seem right to go of a name. Um, so now at this point, I ask you, did class, did Bright invent the wheel? And let's suppose you're all awake and alert and <laughs> still, <laughs> still with me. Um, is the answer yes or no? Did Bright invent the wheel? Did you have to do an extensive archaeological study to find this out? Could you tell just by thinking about it that Bright was invented the wheel? Is it therefore a priori that Bright invented the wheel? Yes, it is a priori that Bright invented the <laughs> A number of people here suspect a trap. <laughs> You're right. Um, <laughs> but yes, it is a priori that Bright invented the wheel. Is it necessary that Bright invented the wheel? No, because in different worlds it comes out false. There are plenty of worlds in which Bright gets beat to it by somebody else, or in which Bright was crushed at birth and never made it to the phase of their life at which, sorry, <laughs> at which they invented the wheel. Right? So, Bright is the inventor of the wheel, is a priori, but not necessary. Isn't that weird? How can that be? I mean, if it's a priori, you can tell just by thinking, but if it's not necessary, you need to look to see which world it is that you're in. So there you go. Okay, that's it for the necessary and a priori. Okay, if you get this far, the important thing at this point really is just work through the theoretical framework and see how it up. But if you set this up the way I've been setting it up, it's, it's, it's actually almost trivial that necessary and a priori come apart in these ways. That you can have something a priori but not necessary, and necessary but not a priori. Yeah. Um, if you, you, if you then think, but how can that be right? This is really weird. Then you need to think about what, what you think is wrong with this because the reasoning here is all very simple. Okay. 
don't know what the time is. Sorry? Nine minutes. Okay. Okay, well, we're going to go fairly rapidly through the rest. Okay. Um, Kripke versus Russell and logically proper names. So remember when we were talking about, and then if you follow me through all this, you, you will really have the current state of the art, it seems to me, and proper names. So, logically proper names. Russell's point about proper names was that um, there's got to be a basic class of names that aren't descriptions, that aren't equivalent to descriptions. Whether there are general terms, there have got to be singular terms. I know singular terms can't themselves be how many phrases like descriptions. So there's got to be a basic class of names that, that gets tied up to objects, but not by being defined in terms of descriptions. And Russell said, so Kripke agrees with that, right? Kripke is saying there's a basic class of names that gets tied up to objects, but not by being defined in terms of descriptions. That's the whole thing, right? These, for Kripke, ordinary proper names aren't defined in terms of descriptions. They're tied up by these causal chains. Um, Russell said logically proper names refer to objects with which we are acquainted. So you have some direct kind of perceptual encounter with the object. That's how you know what object you're talking about. <coughs> and Russell thought when you're acquainted with an object, your encounter with it is so immediate and so direct that you know the object can't but exist. There's no room for uncertainty about whether it exists if you're acquainted with it. It says, well, when you ask, well, what kind of object could that be? The first and most obvious example is sense data. So you're acquainted with your own headaches, your own pains, your own sensations of redness. So the, the names, the logically proper names, are terms like this and that, referring to your own immediate sense data. If you think you've got a headache, then you just do have a headache. If you think you've got a sensation of red, then you just do have a sensation of red. I'm saying when you give your headache a name and you say, this has been bugging me all morning, then the thing you're referring to can't but exist. Russell said, suppose, as happens, suppose that someone who knows Bismarck makes a remark about him. What this person was acquainted with were certain sense data so what you were really acquainted with, if I make a remark about um, Ian, say, um, what I really make a remark about are the sense data that I suppose are connected with the body. The body is the physical body and still more the mind. We're known only as the body and the mind connected with these sense data. That is, they were connected by description. So you get a name like Bismarck, that means something like the person who produced the, whose body produced these sense data in me. So ordinary names are always descriptions, always defined ultimately in terms of sense data. And Bismarck is going to be rigid. Um, uh, the person whose body produced the sense data in me is flexible. So Kripke at this point is going to say Russell got it wrong. Russell has always got to say a name like Bismarck means the same as some description. But that can't be right. Russell went wrong here. Um, you see the, the, the logic that gets Russell to this point because he thinks there are the, you're really only acquainted with your sense data. Um, therefore, Bismarck must be equivalent to a description. But it can't be, Kripke's point is. This is really a logically proper name. The things that look like proper names are really proper names. They're never equivalent to description. Okay, that's Kripke versus Russell. Plain enough? They share the, the idea that there's going to be a basic class of logically proper names. For Kripke, it's just the regular names that are that class. Russell's got a more complicated theory, um, but it doesn't look right because of this thing about what's rigid and what's flexible. Okay? Okay. And finally, this problem about meaning without reference. Kripke's saying logically, ordinary proper names are logically proper names. So when you're um, explaining predicates, when you're explaining the terms of your language and you're um, saying how these how many expressions are witnessed, 
you can use ordinary proper names. But then there's this puzzle, how a remark like Homer does not exist could be true and informative. It might turn out there was never any such person as Homer. You can imagine that. That makes sense, right? It sometimes does turn out that people don't exist, if you see what I mean. That you're using a name for someone who does not exist. Right? Sherlock Holmes doesn't exist. There are lots of people who don't exist. Hamlet. Um, I don't know. There are lots of novels, lots of plays, right? They all, most of them are about people who don't exist. Right? Bilbo Baggins. I mean, okay, <laughs> lots of people who don't exist, right? But then these statements, this does not exist, are true and informative. Now, Frege and Russell and Searle have got a really clear, plausible explanation as to how that could be. If you say Homer does not exist, well, the name Homer is equivalent to a description, the author of the Iliad and the Odyssey or something like that. Um, and what you're saying when you say Homer does not exist is you're saying this description does not, not denote anything. Right? There's nothing that matches that description. But suppose, as I'm recommending, you reject that and you say Homer's never meaning the same. Ho Homer never means the same thing as a description. How can it be that the name Homer makes sense, but it doesn't refer to anything? Um, for Frege and Russell and Sell, a remark like Homer does not exist means, it's got a perfectly clear meaning, it means it's not the case that there is exactly one person meeting the following descriptive conditions. Now Russell has a good account of how it goes for this and that. Well, you're talking about your own sense data. If you say this headache does not exist, well, um, that just can't be true. So it can't be that if you've got a logically proper name, this does not exist, both makes sense and is true. All right? If you're, if you're using an, this to refer to one of your own sense data, and you say this does not exist, it can't be right. Either you haven't identified one of your sense data at all, in which case the name doesn't mean anything, or else you identified one of your sense data, and in that case it's certain to, certainly true that this exists. But if you're not going to have a description theory of reference, and you're going to say that ordinary names are logically proper names, how could it be that you have a statement like Pegasus does not exist that means something and is true? The only way Pegasus means something is by standing for an object. But then if Pegasus does not exist is true, it doesn't stand for an object. So it doesn't mean anything. But a remark like Pegasus does not exist is meaningful and true. If I say Sherlock Holmes does not exist, is meaningful and true. But we just proved that they can't be meaningful and true. If you solve that, let me know. We, do, we need to know. I, that this is really where the argument currently is. Um, Kripke gave a famous set of lectures in um, Oxford some years ago, all about this question, how can remarks like Pegasus does not exist be meaningful and true? And I guess they were a very brilliant set of lectures, but they were completely unsuccessful. Um, Nobody knows how to crack this. Yeah. If you're not going to have a description theory of names, how can it be that these remarks mean something and are correct? Keep in touch. Okay. Putnam next time.